Yo, what's up everyone? Welcome to Small World and thank you for joining me with today's video. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to make a realistic diorama of Greece in 124 scale. I'll cover how to make buildings from foam core, cut and assemble stairs from pink foam, apply stucco texture to walls, make and paint foam stone walkways, make and paint 3D printed details, 3D print and assemble miniature flowers, and much more. Let's get started with the design. Before making the miniature, I 3D modeled the layout of how I wanted the diorama to look. I'll refer to the taller building on the left as building 1 and the shorter one on the right as building 2. As you can see, both buildings sit on a raised platform behind a few walls. I start by cutting the walls of building 1 from half inch foam core. This is the thicker version that you can get at most craft stores. And because it's thicker, it's much harder to cut and takes at least 4-5 to five passes to cut all the way through. With that being said, it's super important to take your time with this step and use a very sharp blade. Be sure to replace it regularly to achieve consistent clean cuts. Don't worry if your foam board has slight dents or damage on the front. The entire surface will be covered by a stucco texture, so these small imperfections won't be visible later on. You can see how slow my cuts are. I'm applying firm pressure to make sure that the blade doesn't slip, but I make sure that the blade is doing most of the work. Now it's time for my least favorite part of the whole project, cutting out the holes for windows and doors. I find this really challenging to cut holes out of foam core this thick. Also, my cuts usually aren't square all the way through. Like before, I take my time until I can easily pop out the piece I just cut. Now I'm test fitting one of my 3D printed doors for building one. The fit looks pretty good and I'm making sure that everything fits properly as I go. That way there are no unpleasant surprises later on in the project. I continue to cut out another door and a window on the facade of building one, following the same process as before. I use the foam safe super glue to add a window sill made from pink foam. With that in place, here's how it looks with the doors and window frame test fitted in place. It's not perfect, but they fit pretty well for the most part. I noticed in my references that a lot of buildings in Greece don't have sharp edges on the corners, so I'm using the side of my paintbrush to roll over all the edges and make them look smoother and not so sharp. You can really use anything that's rounded to run against the edges. A paintbrush is just the first thing I had handy at my workbench. I do the same thing for the edges along the window and door openings. For assembling the walls of the building, I use hot glue because it's easy to use and sets really quickly. I also use a 1-2-3 block to make sure all the pieces are square once glued in place. I do the same for the wall on the other side of the building. With the walls glued on, you can see the seams and edges of the foam core are very pronounced, but again, the stucco texture will cover all of the imperfections later on. Now I'm just continuing the hot glue walls that sit in front of house 1. The next step is to make a staircase that leads up to the front door of building 1. I'm using my Proxon hot wire table to cut pink insulation foam into strips that will make up my steps. I first cut pieces that are an inch and a half wide which makes up the width of the staircase. Then I cut those strips into pieces that are 5 sixteenths of an inch tall, which is the height of each individual step. I leave the heat of the wire on a relatively low setting because I find that it makes more precise cuts this way. Just make sure not to force the foam through the wire and let the wire do the work. I cut out a paper template that's the shape of my staircase and I trace it along a piece of foam that I cut out previously. The bottom few steps have a curvature that needs to be cut on the hot wire table. I just freehand it and take my time until I cut out the shape properly. Here are the first two steps stacked on top of each other. Once I have the profile for one layer cut, I remove that step from the paper template and then trace the new shape on another sheet of foam. Then it's just a matter of cutting out the new shape and repeating the process step by step. I glue the individual layers together using the foam safe super glue. This is the first time I built stairs this way, as the Proxon hot wire table is a relatively new tool in my arsenal. This was actually very easy and satisfying to do, and you can quickly achieve very accurate results. 
This staircase goes around a corner, so I glue another foam block flush with the landing, and then I continue to glue more steps on top of that that lead to the platform of building one. Here, I'm using some foam safe super glue along with tacky glue to attach the staircase to the walls out front of house one. The super glue provides an instant grab, while the tacky glue provides the longer lasting, flexible, and durable bond. Next, I glue a piece between the staircase and building one, which will be a planter box. Now, I'm using the same glues to attach a piece of foam for the balcony, and I use a 1-2-3 block to make sure it's sitting square. Lastly, I glue in a piece of foam core for the roof. Here's how building one looks so far. As you can see, it's starting to take shape with all the details test fitted in place. I'll add a piece for the platform that sits out front of the front door later on. Not everything's perfect however. The window has a gap on the lower left side that needs some filling later. Also, ignore the thickness of the window for now. While it's accurate to some older windows, I redesigned it for the more common, thinner style, which I think looks a lot better. Check out the before and after between the two with the thicker on the left and the thinner on the right. Now I'm continuing to assemble the walls that sit out front of building 2. As you can see, I printed out a ground plan drawing to use as a guide for placing the walls. The process is the same as before, just cutting out the foam walls and gluing them with hot glue. Now I can make the second staircase leading up to building 2. I'm using the drawing to mark my cuts for the pink foam, and again, I'm cutting the pieces with the Proxon hot wire table. Like before, the rise of each step is 5 16 of an inch, and the run is 3 8 of an inch. Each landing is a 1 half inch square. Foam safe super glue is used for attaching all the pieces, and I just work my way up each step. Once the stairs are finished, I use the tacky glue and super glue combo to glue it to one of the wall pieces that I created earlier. Now I'm starting on the shorter building two, and thankfully it's a simple design. I'm cutting out the holes for one door and two windows. My cuts aren't perfect, but that's okay. For this building, I 3D printed some trim that the door and window frames will sit in. This will cover any of my off cuts. Here's how the pieces look test fitted in place. Next, I'm gluing on the wall for the side of building 2, and then a roof piece that sits on top. Here's the completed foam core structure for house 2. I'm using some super glue to attach the trim pieces to fit around the doors and windows of building 2. I pop out the window frames and will install them later again after painting. Any large seams or gaps are filled with spackle before the next step. Now I'll show you how I applied the stucco texture to the buildings and walls. I made my own homemade stucco paste by mixing matte mod podge and white acrylic paint in a cup along with a couple spoonfuls of plaster and some water until I got a brushable paste. I didn't measure any of the ingredients, but you'll see that at times it's runnier and more watered down and at some other times it's much more thick because I had to create multiple batches to cover everything. I started by applying a thick mix into all of the openings of the windows and doors of house 1. As I mentioned before, I had some gaps between the walls and windows on this building, so this is how I filled them. 
I know it looks messy, but it's better to apply more than less at this stage. You can always sand away the excess material until the doors and windows fit properly. Once dried, that's exactly what I did. I used some 400 grit sandpaper to smooth out the paste along each of the hole openings for the windows and doors. I kept doing this until I was happy with the way the windows and doors fit. It's not perfect, but the gaps are much less visible than before. I quickly glue a piece on top of the balcony, and then I apply texture to the remainder of building 1. First, I spread the paste on using a brush and a thin layer. Then, I take the foam brush and I start stippling the surface to create the stucco texture. The more you dab the surface, the finer and more realistic the texture becomes. While this process is super simple, I completely underestimated how long it would take. In all, I probably spent about 4 days applying texture to all the walls of the entire project. Not only does it take a while to get the texture fine enough to be in scale, but I applied multiple applications to build up the density that I was looking for. Each wall and building received at least 2 applications. Some even needed 3 or 4 coats. If you're only doing one building, this process could easily be finished within a day. But since this project has a lot of surface area, that's why it took me so long to do. With all that being said, I think the effort was worth it and I was pleased with the results of the texture. What's nice about this homemade paste is not only is it cheap, but you can use it to create a variety of surfaces and textures. It sticks really well to the foam core surface and I had no issues with it flaking off after it dried. If you're going to be overly ambitious and make several walls and buildings with this texture, then I definitely recommend having a lot of brushes and foam brushes at your disposal. You can get away with cleaning each brush maybe once or twice, but over time the plaster will dry and make your brushes useless. You also achieve more consistent results and have more control over the texture if you keep using fresh and clean brushes. On a side note, the paste dries pretty quickly once applied to the surface, but the pot life in the cup is pretty long. Most of the time, I could use the same batch of paste for about 45 minutes to an hour. This is a much longer pot life than if I were to just use an ordinary batch of plaster and water. Once dry, I glue the two wall pieces together that sit out front of building 2 with the super glue and tacky glue combination. Again, I'm using the printed ground plan drawing to make sure that things line up properly. I fill any gaps between the walls and stairs using a thick mixture of the stucco paste and a brush. This worked out fine, but I'll show you another method later on. Here's the assembled piece, and then I added a piece of foam for the platform that the stairs lead up to, and this is also what building 2 will sit on. I glue a piece of foam to fill a gap between the stairs and the platform using the foam safe super glue. I had a large gap between the platform piece and one of the walls, so I filled it with a piece of foam and then I smoothed out any irregularities with spackle. Next, I quickly add a foam piece for the platform of building 1, and again I use a piece of foam to fill a gap between the stairs and the platform. And here's how the completed pieces look with the stucco texture applied. Again, I am very pleased with how the texture came out, and I think it looks very realistic. Grease has a lot of variety in the surface finish of exterior walls. Some are completely smooth and some are extremely rough. I decided to go somewhere in between, more towards the rough side based off some reference images. Now I'm using some super glue and hot glue to attach building 1 to the building 2 platform. I just hold the pieces together until the hot glue sets. I flip the model on its backside, and I'm applying tacky glue to all of the bottom edges. I marked how I wanted the building to sit on a 2 foot by 2 foot plywood base, and then I just set the model in place. I wasn't sure if tacky glue was the right glue for this, but it worked perfectly and dried super strong. Then I added some more tacky glue to the bottom and side of building 2, and I attached it to sit flush against building 1 and the second platform. Once in place, I used a 1-2-3 block to make sure building 2 was sitting flush against building 1. And here's how it looks so far glued to the base. It's starting to come together nicely, but there's still lots of work to do. I had a large gap between the staircase of house 1 and the platform of house 2, so I filled it with spackle and a silicone brush. 
This was super easy to do, and while the previous method of using an ordinary brush and thickened stucco mix worked well, I thought this was easier. I also had a small gap between the building one and building two, but this was quickly filled with spackle. I created one last wall that sits in the back against the right side of building two and goes all the way to the edge of the diorama base, so I quickly glued it in place with tacky glue. I made a couple of planner boxes using some scrap pink foam and I glued them in place next to the bottom of each staircase. There's a lot of empty space in the foreground of the diorama base. Initially, I didn't have a plan for this area, but I decided to make an observatory platform. I glued a short wall along the front edge of the wooden diorama base. Then, I cut a piece of foam for the foreground platform itself, and I fixed it in place with tacky glue. I cut it at an angle so it ran parallel to the walls out front of buildings 1 and 2. I made some more foam planter boxes to line the perimeter edge of the platform, which helped it feel more integrated into the space. I left two entryways to step up on top of the platform from the walkway on the wooden base. And here's the final construction of the foreground platform and the planner boxes. I think it fills up the space nicely and looks much better than leaving the foreground open. I mix one last batch of stucco paste and I coat all the new pieces that I added. It was nice knowing I didn't have to mix any more batches after this because I was already getting tired of applying the texture at this point. With all the texture finished, I gave all the stucco surfaces a coat of white paint. This might seem redundant, but the white paint actually helps unify any irregularities on the surface. The stucco paste didn't cover everything equally, so in places, some of the foam core and pink foam was showing through. Also, the paste was slightly an off-white color, and the white paint is much brighter and realistic for these buildings. Also, because I'm painting everything, it means it'll be much easier to touch up the walls if I need to in the future. And here's how it looks after the paint. Pretty much the same as before, but now we're ready for the next steps. Now it's time to make the stone walkways. I cut several sheets of foam on my hot wire table to be roughly a sixteenth of an inch thick. Then, I stamped a stone texture into them using a ball of aluminum foil. From there, I used scissors and cut the sheets into randomly shaped strips. Then I take the strips and cut them randomly to the rough size I want my individual stones to be. Then I take my individual stone pieces and round the corners with the scissors which is definitely the most time consuming part. I found that in my references that the stones vary depending on what island you're on. Even though it took me a long time, I preferred the stones with the rounded edges. Once I had enough stones, I started to glue them to the walkways using matte Mod Podge. The process is simple, just brush on some glue and randomly put the stones in place close together with a small gap in between. It's kind of like doing a puzzle, except none of the pieces actually fit together and you're just doing your best. This is how they look all glued down, and I think it looks pretty cool. I made sure to apply the stones to the two upper platforms as well. Once the glue dried completely, I went back and stamped more stone texture into some of the stones with aluminum foil. This was the last time I could add additional texture to the stones before painting. Now I'm using some masking tape to mask off wall sections before painting the stones. I think this step is optional, however. It definitely helps keep some of the mess off the walls, but even with the tape, I had to touch up the white paint later on anyways. I started by base coating all of the stones with this dark gray color. It kind of has a brownish green tint to it. The only thing to keep in mind with this step is to make sure you cover all of the pink. 
Occasionally, I would dip my brush in some water because I found that it helped spread the paint easier, especially since there was a lot of texture in the stones that the paint needed to coat. Some of you may be wondering why I opted for individual stones with this diorama. Normally, I'm a big proponent of scribing stones into one piece of foam, especially for walls. However, the gaps between these stones are pretty large, not the small gaps you find between bricks. It would probably take a similar amount of time to dig out all of the wide large gaps from a single piece of foam as it would to just make individual stones anyways. This is how the base coat looks dry. Now, I'm applying a heavy dry brush layer of another dark gray. This one is slightly lighter than the last one and has much more of a brown color mixed in. The dry brushing helps bring out some of the texture that I made with the aluminum foil. However, this dry brush layer is still pretty subtle due to the grays being similar values. Next, I dry brush a much lighter gray on top and I make sure not to apply it as heavy as the previous layer. I do one last dry brush layer over the stones using a light beige color. Again, all of these layers work nicely together to help bring out that stone texture from earlier. Next, I use a smaller brush and do a heavy dry brush over individual stones with the same beige color. This helps add some variety to the individual stones so not all of them appear to be the same gray color. A few tan stones here and there were pretty common in my reference photos. I did the same technique using a darker brown color to add some more variation. And here's the final paint job. I think they look decent, definitely not the most realistic finish I've done, but it gets the idea across, and this will look much more cohesive once the grout lines are filled. However, before adding the grout, I steal the paint job in using a coat of diluted matte Mod Podge. This will help protect the painted finish once I spread the spackle over the grout lines. I've gotten away with skipping this step in the past doing my brickwork because bricks are much more flat and the mortar lines are much thinner, so you can easily rub away any excess spackle on the bricks with your fingers. However, these stones have much wider grout lines and the surface is much rougher than the bricks, so I have to be pretty aggressive when applying the spackle. Once the Mod Podge is all applied, I let it dry overnight before starting the next step. I apply spackle between the stones using a scrap piece of styrene. This really helps spread the spackle between all the stones. To remove excess spackle from the tops of each stone, I apply firm pressure with the styrene sheet and drag it along the surface. This does a good job of removing the spackle from the tops of the stones while leaving the rest in the joints between the stones. I repeat this process for all of the stone surfaces. Occasionally, I find that it's easier to spread the spackle using my fingers, especially in areas against walls or tight corners. Once applied, I remove the yellow masking tape and as you can see, it definitely helped, but some stains still got under the surface and stained the white walls. I'll be fixing this later on. While the styrene sheet removed most of the spackle from the tops of the stones, some of it's still present on the top surface of several stones, making them appear slightly chalky. At first, I was going to leave it, but I couldn't find any references of stone walkways with the white texture on top of the stones themselves. So I mixed up a dark gray wash and painted over all the white spots. I know that it looks like I'm painting the stones a solid color, but the wash is actually highly diluted. Once dry, the white spots turn to more of a light gray color, which looks very realistic. I definitely had to take my time with this step, as I wanted to make sure that I only painted the stones and didn't get any of the paint on the white grout joints. And here's how the finished stone work turned out. It took a few days, but I'm pretty happy with the results. Now I'm touching up all the white walls that received some brown and gray stains from the stone painting phase. This step really helped tidy up the diorama and made everything look much more sharp and clean looking.
For the foam step I added to the front door of building 2, I decided that a light grey color would look nice against the dark grey stonework and the white walls of the building. Not to mention there were lots of photos of grey painted accents on these Greek buildings. Now with all the gaps filled and everything painted properly, it's time to move on to the next step. I 3D modeled and printed tons of details for this diorama, and now it's time to remove all the supports from the prints. Support removal is another one of those not so fun parts of making miniatures, but it's one of those things that you kind of have to grind through in order to take your model to the next level. The parts are just very fragile, so again, it's super important to take your time with this step. I absolutely love being able to 3D model and print specific parts for a project. Also, if it interests anyone, all of the 3D prints that you see in this video, and from my previous videos for that matter, are available for download on my Patreon. Your support there really helps making these dioramas feasible for me, and the 3D files are just one of the perks that you get in return. Removing the supports from the table was the most difficult one. I think I broke a leg off of every table when removing their supports, but luckily, the brakes were clean and just a dot of super glue solved all the issues. I like using the X-Acto blade and some side cutters for removing most supports. Any leftover nubs on the model can usually be scraped away with an X-Acto blade. While complex shapes like chairs and tables are harder to remove supports from, flat objects like this railing are much easier. Just a couple swipes with the X-Acto and it easily breaks away from the supports. Any leftover remnants can be removed by rubbing them away with your fingers. Just be sure to be gentle as the railing itself is very fragile. I repeat this for a gate and another railing and the windows and doors were similar to this process as well. I used a couple dabs of super glue to attach the sides of the railing to the front piece. This railing is for the balcony on building 1. All of the pieces needed some amount of sanding, but the tables and chairs especially. I sanded over all of the areas where the supports were attached with 400 grit sandpaper. This worked out really well, but it took quite a while to do. Also, it's extremely important to be wearing a respirator for this phase. Resin dust is very toxic and it's not something that you want to be breathing in, so please be careful. I had to sand 16 chairs, 8 tables, 4 window shutters, and several flower pots. All of the flat pieces like the doors, windows, railings, etc. needed some slight sanding as well. Here you can see the difference between the print off the printer with all the supports on the left compared to the clean model on the right. Now it's time to make a trellis that attaches to building 2. I printed out a plan drawing so I could see how all the pieces connect together. I cut two beams to length, one will be attached at two posts and the other attaches to the facade of building 2. I also use a pen to mark where the rafter pieces attach to the beams by using a plan drawing. I glued two square quarter inch basswood posts to the front beam using super glue. The beams are a quarter inch by an eighth of an inch thick. This is how the front beam looks with the two posts attached. I actually 3D printed the rafter pieces. Normally I would have made them from balsa wood, however I designed this to have a pretty strange angle and it would have taken me a long time to notch the balsa wood planks because of that. With the 3D printed parts I knew that everything would line up properly against the two beams. I just glued the notched 3D printed rafter pieces in place using some super glue. I started by attaching the end pieces to both beams using the markings I made. This gave me the correct overall shape. Due to the odd shape of the trellis, I thought it was going to take a long time and need some tweaking to fit nicely against the building. However, it fit perfectly and only took about a half hour to make. Here's the completed trellis. I'm very happy with the way it turned out. 
Now I'm marking where to glue hinges on the back sides of my 3D printed shutters for building one. I put a mark at 5 16ths of an inch away from both ends and I glue my 3D printed hinges at those marks using super glue. Here, I'm painting all of my 3D printed pieces with an airbrush. These were all primed with Tamiya Surface Primer before this step. I used three shades of blue for this diorama. All the tables and chairs were painted a nice, vibrant, medium blue color. I mixed the color using a blue from Mr. Hobby and a blue lacquer by Tamiya. This is a gloss paint, so I left the tables in the glossy finish, but I put a matte clear over the chairs as I wouldn't be so shiny. Luckily the paints I used covered very well and I used my airbrush with a small needle to ensure that I didn't apply too much paint at once. The chair cushions were painted with Tamiya Buff, and you can see why I printed them separately from the chairs themselves. It's so much easier to paint different colored pieces separately. All of the accessories for Building 2 were painted with this light color by Rust-Oleum. I actually decanted the spray paint by spraying it in a cup, and I thinned it down with Tamiya Lacquer Thinner. It sprayed beautifully through my airbrush and it covered extremely well. I decanted the paint because sometimes large spray cans can put out too much paint at once and they can flood details of your small parts if you're not careful. An airbrush gives you more control over how much paint you actually use. All the parts for building one were painted with a dark blue color by Rust-Oleum. Again, I decanted the paint and sprayed it through my airbrush. At first, I was afraid that this color was too dark, however, once everything was assembled, I really like how the color looked. I used some acrylic raw sienna and burnt sienna to further paint the chair cushions. All I did was brush the paint in the direction of the lines that I modeled with the print. Some patchiness or streaks help add to the finish that you commonly see with these cushions. I used a Tamiya gloss black spray paint for the railing. Tamiya spray cans are actually very good at providing a light, even coat of paint, so if you don't have an airbrush, I'd recommend them for sure. I masked off these two sections for the front door of building 2 and sprayed it white. Here, I'm attaching some door handles that I 3D printed and painted. I used chrome door handles for the dark blue doors and black ones for the light blue. I feel like the small details like these really help sell the illusion of making a realistic miniature. I used some foam safe super glue to attach clear plastic behind the windows to imitate glass. This foam safe super glue is important for this step. This is the only super glue that I've used that doesn't haze clear plastic. Normally, super glue fogs up clear plastic parts. If you don't have this super glue, you can always use white glue or thin cement as an alternative. The glass in the windows really ties these details together and adds another layer of realism to the overall look. Here are the chairs after painting. I apply some super glue to the edges of the tops where the cushions will sit, then I just simply pop the cushions in place on top of the glue. Seeing these chairs come together really makes all the time spent cleaning the supports and sanding worth it. I paint the terracotta flower pots by hand using some acrylic paint. Ironically, most acrylic terracotta colors are too red for these pots. References show more of a yellow-brown color. Each pot took two coats of paint and I made sure to apply a surface primer beforehand. Now it's time to install the windows and doors. I simply just press them into place because the tolerances are so tight, especially after using the stucco paste to fill in the gaps. I may go back and add some glue to the inside at a later date though. I used some tacky glue to glue the trellis in place. The two posts were glued to the tops of the platform walls, and the back beam was glued to the facade of building 2. The shutters were glued to the window frames of building 1. Just a couple dots of super glue on the hinges did the trick. The balcony railing was attached using tacky glue on the ends. I used some super glue to attach a gate and a railing to one of the landings of the second staircase.
This is when I finally was actually pleased with the way things were looking. Up until this point, I may have liked the way individual techniques turned out, but I was doubtful about the overall diorama and how it would come together. Seeing all these painted, finished details I 3D modeled and printed finally in place was super relieving to see. I used a twig from a sagebrush plane to act as a trunk for one of my flower bushes that will sit on top of the trellis. I glued the base of it in a planter box with tacky glue, and I glued the branch down to the trellis using super glue. I filled the planter boxes using real dirt that I sifted from my front yard. I just plop a spoonful in place and spread it out with a brush. Then, I soaked it with isopropyl alcohol and then used a pipette to drizzle some watered down Mod Podge to lock everything in place. I know it looks like a mess, but trust me, it works every time. The isopropyl alcohol breaks the surface tension, which allows the glue to penetrate through all the dirt. If you skip the alcohol step, the glue would just beat up on the surface of the dirt. Here's how the model looks at this point. Now it's time to add some green stuff. All of the greenery I used was from Diorama Presepe. No, I'm not sponsored by them, but I just think that they make the best scenery products on the market. I'm gluing these leaves from the surrender bush to the top of the trellis using tacky glue. All of the leaves are attached to a mossy carpet underneath them, so as long as the glue touches the moss, you shouldn't have to worry about the leaves falling off. I used the queen bush to fill the planter boxes by each staircase, again, fixing it in place with tacky glue. These plants look exactly like the greenery I researched in my reference photos. I want to add some growth to the wall trellis above one of the planter boxes, so I'm painting the trunks of this plant with some brown paint to add some more realism. Then, I just glue them in place with tacky glue. I use smaller pieces of the same plant to fill the planter boxes that surround the perimeter of the foreground platform. I simply dip the ends in tacky glue and set them in place. I'm not too worried if I leave a few bare spots, I'll be adding some flowers later on. And here's how the model looks with all the greenery in place. I think that these plants look absolutely stunning and I'd honestly be happy with leaving the model like this. However, Greece is iconic for its beautiful and vibrant flowers. Believe it or not, the flowers are one of the most intimidating parts for me on this project. I know that in the modeling community that dyed crushed foam is a popular choice for emulating flowers, but I wanted to try a different approach. I 3D modeled and printed some basic flower shapes in two sizes. One is roughly a sixteenth of an inch and the other is almost an eighth of an inch. I painted some a lighter pink color and the others a darker magenta color. Once painted, I snipped each individual flower bud off using some side cutters. Take your time with this step and be careful not to send your flowers flying across the room while snipping them away from their supports. My plan is to individually glue these to some seafoam plants. On the left is the natural color, and on the right is how it looks after I primed it brown. I tear the primed seafoam into smaller chunks. First, I spray the small piece of seafoam with some zip kicker, then I grab a flower, dip it in some super glue, and attach it to the plant soaked with zip kicker. The kicker causes the super glue to dry instantly. I just keep adding the flowers one at a time. It'd be nice to have some proper model making tweezers, but these still do the trick. Also, make sure you wear a respirator when using Zip Kicker. It has very strong fumes, so just be sure to be safe. I spent one and a half days gluing flowers to these seafoam plants, and I think I glued roughly 900 flowers or so. As I was saying earlier, you totally could just use crushed foam for this step. It would be a lot quicker and it could provide a more dense looking patch of flowers, but for me at this scale, I find that crushed foam looks pretty fake. From a distance it looks fantastic, but the closer I get, all I see is foam. I don't think these 3D printed flowers are perfect by the way, but I like how they provide a little more detail up close. This was something new that I've never done before, and I thought it would be fun to try out as well. The flowers on the left are the lighter pink ones, and the ones on the right are the magenta color that's more on the purple side. Here are all of the plants that I made. I know it doesn't look like much, but these took forever to make. 
I use a small funnel to fill the flower pots with dirt, and again, I soak them with alcohol and diluted Mod Podge to lock the dirt in place. Here, I'm adding some more plants from Diorama Presepe. I actually got these miniature preserved red flowers from Hobby Lobby over a year ago. I believe I found these flowers in the jewelry section. They provide some nice variety to my 3D printed ones. I'm only using these for the potted plants, but these could also be another good substitute for crushed foam flowers. The rest of the pots are filled with some greenery from Diorama Presepe, along with some flowers that I previously made. I combine a few of these plants together by gluing their trunks with super glue to make a small tree. Then, like before, I paint the trunks with acrylic brown paint to make them look more realistic. Once dry, I dry brush them with a lighter tan color to add some more texture and achieve a more realistic result. Then, I apply some tacky glue to the bottom and stick the trunk into a pot. Then, I apply my flower bushes using some super glue. And this is how this little plant turned out and I love the final result. I start applying my flower bushes to the rest of the diorama. I'm gluing the purpley magenta flowers with tacky glue to the bush on the trellis. I use the same color to fill the planters below with the queen bushes installed. The brighter pink flowers are glued into the planter boxes that line the platform in the foreground, and they were also used for the potted plants that I added the flowers to. I add a few tables and chairs with tacky glue to the upper platform outside building too to make it look more like a cafe. I glued two more tables along the stone pathway, right by the second staircase. Three more tables are added along the platform in the foreground. With all the furniture in place, I continue to add more potted plants across the whole diorama. As a final touch, I added some individual flower buds to the stone walkway under the flower beds to simulate fallen petals. It's a small detail, but it's a really effective one. I took the model outside in the sun to get these shots of the final result. It was very rewarding to see the whole project come together at the end. This model was completely different than any project I've ever done before. In my previous works, painting and weathering was my favorite part of the process which was very limited in this project. Everything was painted white while the details were painted blue and there was no weathering. But surprisingly, I didn't miss the weathering process in this project. There was something very satisfying with just popping in my finished doors and windows and seeing the final result right there and then. I learned a lot throughout this build, but probably my favorite thing I learned was using the 3D printed flowers. I think there's a lot of potential to expand upon this technique in future projects. Also, I want to give a big thank you to all my patrons. Your support means a lot to me, and it helps fund these projects. You really help keep me inspired to complete everything all the way through. If you'd like to join them and support me on Patreon, I'll have a link in the description below.
Depending on what tier you select, you'll have access to behind the scenes pictures from whatever project I'm working on before I post on any other platform. Also, the STL files of all of the 3D prints in this video, as well as files from other projects, are available for download on Patreon. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.